So we're in for a treat today. Um, we have an excellent guest chef, and I would like to bring up uh, Haley Matson mathis who's the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. This is a nonprofit organization that supports culinary education at a lot of levels, high school, post-secondary like us, as well as professionals, professional cooks, and professional chefs. Haley. Thank you, Chef Don. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, and I'm glad we can do this virtually and look forward to when we can do it in person going forward. The Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation is dedicated to all of you students because you're the next generation of culinary in Hawaii. And our mission with these programs, uh, bringing in outstanding guest chefs, is to elevate culinary education in Hawaii and in working and mentoring at the high schools to connect working professional chefs with culinary students at the high school level so they will come on to the community college or go directly to work in the uh, restaurant industry. Uh, our, Don serves on our board, uh, advisory board, and we appreciate that. And the board works very hard to raise funds so that we can put together these programs that are taught on all the community college culinary programs each semester. Our guest chef today is an outstanding professional and the entire package. Chef Robin Maite is a chef who has accomplished so much in her career. She grew up in Hawaii, born and raised, uh, and has a culinary and pastry degree from Cap Capilani Community College. But she also has an undergraduate degree in dance and English from Middlebury College and a master's degree from NYU, and that is actually in food studies. In addition to that, she began her career working at 3660 on the rise. She also worked for Pierre Padovani in the pastry department or as a pastry cook. And then she went on to New York City where she worked for Rocco Dispirito and at the Waldorf Astoria in the pastry kitchen. So that's significant in and of itself, but in addition to that, she also taught culinary in New York and worked at Gourmet Magazine, so she has a writing background and manages that. She is the chef owner of Fat Restaurant in Chinatown. She moved back to Hawaii, thanks, and we're very grateful for that because she brings a lot to the Hawaii culinary scene with their restaurant that she owns with her husband, Chuck. As the chef owner of FET, it is a, 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 she'll tell you about the cuisine that she offers there, but it's really a love letter to American cuisine and a passion for what they love to eat. And as if that wasn't enough, uh, and she managed to somehow work this class into her schedule this week, they recently opened a restaurant in Waikiki, and she'll visit with you about that. It's called Hey Day. And that very busy schedule all culminated in this one week, but she made it a priority to be here with all of you today. And I think you're going to enjoy what she has to share about lamb and local ingredients because she has an intense passion and it shows up on the menu for ingredients that are grown and raised here in Hawaii. My great pleasure to welcome Chef Robin here with us today. Can I take this off? Yeah? Okay. Oh, they can't see me. Hi. Can you hear me? Am I supposed to talk to you? No. Just here? Okay. Hi, everyone. This is really weird. Um, I want to say hi to Alec. Hi, Alec. I want to say hi to Raven. Hi, Raven. We miss you. Um, and I want to thank the faculty and staff for inviting me. Thank you, Haley, for always including me. Um, those of you who don't know, I spent most of my culinary career uh, teaching in an educational capacity. So even though I've been out of the classroom since 2015, um, I really, really miss um, teaching. And so when Haley asks, I always try to say yes. Um, and she's so patient with me as she, she's like a corgi. She just keeps on coming back to me and nudging me along to like get my stuff, my work done. So um, I feel like a student still. So thank you, Haley. Um, today we have um, the faculty asked me to talk about lamb. And I, I love lamb. 
Lamb is my favorite. Um, I think that people misunderstand lamb and they think that it's strong tasting. And I think it's lovely tasting, especially because we can get our hands on local lamb these days. And the gods were with us. And it just so happened that we were able to get um, two local, well, actually, this is one local lamb, but Fett was able to get two of these. And so we're going to go, I'm going to go through the subprimals and the cuts, which I think that all of you have been, have covered in fundamentals. Okay. So, but I just want to start off by saying that, does everyone know that lamb is baby sheep? Does everyone know? Okay. So it's so funny because people are saying like, oh, I don't need veal, right? Which animal does a veal come from? Cow, right? Um, and then there's a, they say the same breath, oh, but I love lamb. And I'm like, you know, that's a baby sheep, right? Okay, so lamb is a baby sheep. Usually between six and seven months old is when they're, um, they're harvested. Anything over 16 months is then considered mutton. And um, mutton is very delicious eating too. It just has a stronger flavor profile. Um, but I want to go back to why I love lamb so much. Let's see. I'm going to put on some gloves so I can touch the meat. Okay. So you can see the carcass both sides here, and they nicely fit on a full sheet pan. So I can't remember what the hang weight of this animal was, probably about 100 pounds or so. And this is a little smaller than what you see on the market. But um, what I love about lamb is that, you know, in cooking class, they say, okay, you start off with a, talking about a cut of meat, and then the next thing is, okay, what do we do? What do we do with it? Do we grill it? Do we braise it? Um, do we broil it? Do we saute it? And the wonderful thing about lamb is I've, I've like, done all parts of the lamb, grill. And I know that there are certain parts, well, except for the shanks, but we'll get to that later. But all this like shoulder meat and butt meat that will go over, if you cut it the right way and you quickly marinate it, you can, you can eat it straight off the grill. It's that tender. And so that's why I love, 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 love lamb. Um, I also feel like it's a little bit better for you. It's a little bit leaner than beef. And so it's just my first choice if I go out to eat. Um, and then also, this is not like a political class, but there's all sorts of issues about beef in this country. So um, I'm sure that you guys are touching on that in class. But uh, there, there are fewer problems with lamb in our country. OK. and. There's a lot of lamb coming from New Zealand and Australia, and um, that tends to have sort of a gamier flavor profile. But uh, this, is, this is from Maui. It just got flown in last week, Wednesday, and we're, we're going to go through the whole cuts. OK? So let's start with the head. OK, so pretend the neck and the head are here. OK? And then, so you can see how this part you can see going into the neck. And then we are going straight into like the shoulder. So this is the rib cage, and then we go into the shoulder joint right here. Okay, do you see that? Okay, so it's beautiful. This is nice for roasting, but we also cut this up and we make like little cubes. So you can make lamb navarin, which is a French lamb stew, or we can marinate them and then make skewers. Okay, so now we're going to go into the rib cavity. So this is the breast, which again is nice for riblets and barbecue. And this part here is the coveted part. This is the rack of lamb. This is sort of like what everybody pays the big bucks for. 
Okay, and normally if you go to a restaurant, you'll see single chops or double chops. Sometimes if you go to a glorious dinner party, you'll have like a whole crown roast. So we can, we can roast this all together like this, or we can, we can portion it into single or double or even triple chops. And then you see this here, and you'll probably do this in class, your fabrication class, but you can French, you can cut along here and French the bones so you get these like really, really gorgeous, like easy to eat lollipops. I actually don't French, we don't French at, at um, FET because we like people to like have a very tactile experience and it's very nice eating to like eat right off the bone. Okay, but my favorite cut we're gonna move down, is the loin chop. It is like a baby T-bone. Do you see that? So you have this tenderloin piece here, and then just like, like a porterhouse, right? It's my favorite. At FET, when we get whole animals in like this, because there's only so many, right? There's only so many of each. So it's like, I always laugh when you go to a restaurant and they have rack of lamb on the menu. It's like, I start counting how many animals, right, to have rack of lamb on the menu. So what we do is <clears throat> we portion all, so these, these eat pretty similarly. So we portion all of the, um, the loin chop and all of the rib chop, and then we mix and match, and make sure everyone has a little bit, little of each, and so that's what we do because that's, nature doesn't, there's only, there's only two sides on each animal, right? And this is probably be about four portions if you just ate the rib, the rib, the rib, lamb rib. Okay, then we have the back leg, okay? So these two cuts, the shoulder and the butt are pretty similar, right? So it's that big muscle, it's that big muscle group that's right above the legs. And again, really nice roasting. Um, I like to butterfly this, marinate it, and throw it on the grill. It's my, like, I love it. It's like, everyone's like, oh wait, you grill the leg of lamb? I'm like, yep, we grill the leg of lamb. Makes really, really great eating. And then, of course, we have the lamb shank. And this is actually a really small lamb. This is like, this is like cute little legs, okay? I mean, these, you have to braise these because I don't know if you can see all the sinew and the connective tissue. It's really not worth it to get in there and take the meat off. It's just nicer to braise this. Long and slow, lots of herbs and some wine and it's, it's beautiful eating. And this is higher up on the leg. This is like, oh no, sorry. This is the end of the, of the spine. Yes, that's the end of the spine, the saddle. This can be grilled and it can be braised too, but oftentimes the meat is taken off and just ground. So, when an animal is this small, we, we actually don't get a lot of trim on this. So, um, because we try to make use of the cuts as is. When we get bigger animals, we have typically a, a little bit more trim, and so we can make more ground lamb. Okay. You guys are very lucky. This like, was totally, like, came together for us for today. Okay, let me put this away. It's so weird not having seen you guys. I know you're there though. They're all chatting a lot. Oh, really? Okay. And then, and then, and then the truth is, so the first, this is our second time getting lamb from Maui. Um, the first time I was telling the chef instructors that the animal came like this in a cooler like a really big cooler, like that. And, you know, we're a little restaurant, we don't have a bandsaw. So it took me 
And I don't break down whole animals all that often. It took me four hours to do it with a regular saw. Like, yes, like a regular saw. Um, but a friend of mine is running this program in Maui, and so he was able, we're working on trying to get a lamb program, get the um, lamb in on a more regular basis. And so he found a butcher, and um, Vincent so nicely cut up the animal for us. And, but of course, I, help, I had Chef Matt help me piece the animal back together for you. <laughs> OK, so today I'm going to make, um, so you're wondering where I got this ground, ground lamb from. So this ground lamb I turned into sausage. And this was from our first lamb that we got just like a few months ago. So we saved the, um, the trim, and then we ground it this morning, and then turned it into lamb sausage. Now, probably on camera, it looks pretty brown. Um, lamb turns color really quickly. And so in your recipe that I gave to you guys, we do have, we added a little bit of pink salt, just as a preservative. But I'm going to cook this up all the way. So it should be, it's, it's going to be fine. Not should be, it will be fine. OK. What is on again? OK. Who has, is there anyone that hasn't tasted lamb before? Bunch of people. And I'm assuming, um, chef instructors, that there's going to be some lamb cookery happening in class, right, while they're here. At, there's going to be lamb cookery of some kind? OK. Yeah, lamb cookery at some kind. Some kind. And then what is the rule? Everyone has to taste? Yeah. If they've never had it? Yeah. Like, too bad if you have ick factor? Yeah. OK, good. A lot of them actually said they have tasted it. Right? OK, there's, good. There's a handful who have it, but okay. a lot of them have tasted it. So in our, at the restaurant, one of um, our favorite dishes is called <clears throat> lamb cavatelli. And cavatelli is a, is a, ha is a handmade pasta. It's actually more like a dumpling. We make it, we actually use a hand machine, like a crank. Nothing's mechanized. The Italians are very, very smart. They make tools that didn't need any electricity. So we make the cavatelli out of ricotta cheese and eggs and pasta flour. Lots of black pepper. And then this lamb is sort of in between a Mediterranean style, or Italian, and Middle Eastern. So it has fennel, it has coriander, it has crushed red pepper, salt, pepper, and white wine. Okay, does anybody know why there's white wine involved? Right. So those of you who, have take, who are taking Garmage or when is sausage making? In Garmage? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, this week they're making sausages. Okay. Wow. So, you know, this is like a sausage. We call it like a sausage farce. You're going to hear that word. So basically, it's like a, a ground meat mixture. And, you know, at FET, we don't, we don't do any, um, like, sausage with casings. We just don't have the manpower or the, or the time to do that. So we make a lot of, like, sausage mixes. So you can see as the meat cooks, it's actually turning pink. At FET, we love herbs, fresh herbs. So there's a lot of parsley in here as well. And I always
always, there's always like, I call it secret ingredient, but it's not really a secret ingredient. It's the ingredient that all the grandmothers forget to tell you. Oh, can you, how do you make your tomato sauce? And they're like, oh, just tomatoes and like basil and olive oil. And they forget to tell you that they put a pinch of sugar in there. And that's why when you make it, it's never the same. Well, this recipe has a nice pinch of sugar and it's very important to the sausage. Okay. So in with this, we have a sofrito. And traditionally a sofrito is found in Latin cooking or Italian cooking. And it's like the Mediterranean version of um, mirepoix, right? But um, our sofrito has fennel, local fennel, local onions, and saffron. That's why it's orange. If someone were to ask me, what's your favorite vegetable? I have two. One is fennel, and the other one is sunchokes, which are Jerusalem artichokes. And we're able to get that at, um, from one crazy farmer in Waianae. Everyone told him that he couldn't do it, and he managed to figure out how to do it. Okay, into the saute pan, I added some green olives. Okay. So the green olives add some salt and some brininess so that counteracts the richness of the lamb. Lamb is very, very rich. Okay, that's enough. And then we have some preserved lemon here, which we make at the restaurant. Turn this off for a second. Okay. All right. Here's the lamb cavatelli. Can you see that? I mean the cavatelli. So they look like little worms. Okay. So once we used to be able to get, you know, it's it's very interesting trying to source things locally, um, especially with meat. Things are always changing. So we used to get our lamb from um, Niihau. And then they, it stopped. And then we were getting some lamb from the Big Island. And then it stopped. And you know, a, a few years ago, we really tried hard to make a commitment that all of our meat, except for the bacon, we don't have time to make our own bacon, um, that we source locally. And we've been pretty faithful to that. Um, but it's very, diff it's very hard. And so we only put this dish on when, we, when we're lucky enough to have lamb. And people get sad. But it's OK. Because you know what? It makes people appreciate things more, right? And so I don't know. At some point in the last, like, 30 years, we got spoiled in America. We just want everything all the time, whenever we want it, even if it wasn't in season. And that became the, the normal. Um, I think with the pandemic happening and with us being environmentally more conscious, um, people are realizing that we have to like really appreciate what we have when we can get it. So we don't feel bad anymore. We used to feel bad. Oh, just got to come back. Okay. All right. So what I'm looking for for the cavatelli is just for these guys to float. And I'm just going to let that boil. OK. Are there any questions while I wait for this to boil? Do you want to read the question? Okay. Chef Abby is going to read the question to me. Okay. Question is, what made you fall in love with, with food and cooking and pursuing this as a career? Um, when I was in college and I majored in something very impractical, um, 
right? I told my parents I was majoring in dance and they nearly like fainted because they were spending so much money to send me to college. Um, I couldn't stop thinking about food and whenever I was stressed out, I would like, of course I would like, I think Chef Abby can relate, but like I found myself if I was stressed out, like I should be studying for a final exam, but then I'm like in the, cook, in the kitchen making cookies. <laughs> um, so, and then I thought I wanted to bake only, and I realized that I, I really loved just cooking. I loved the process. I loved, I loved how physical my day was. I loved seeing, I mean, I still get goosebumps when I braise. I still get goosebumps when I put a sheet of pate in the in the, um, the oven. Like, I just watch there and I look for it. I still get goosebumps when um, our naturally leavened bread has this, like, insane um, oven spring. It, it never ceases to, um, like, it's always exciting. And I'm always amazed that it happens, even, even after, gosh, 30 years of cooking. So that's what makes me, I think, and I, I think we're lucky. Like, we're lucky that we get to do something that we love every single day. Like, I think about, like, people who do, like, document review for a law firm, and I'm just like, ah! Okay, this is almost here. Anything else? What is your go-to dish to make or your favorite thing to eat? Um, it's funny, eggs and rice. <laughs> eggs and rice. And um, someone just sent me an article about uh, eggs, eggs and rice being a comfort food and how like every single culture has their version of eggs and rice. Right? Yeah. It was amazing, it was amazing. So I just like it very simple, um, local white rice, two sunny side, oh, sorry, two over easy eggs and show you. That's it. Yeah. Delicious. Very simple. Anything else? Yes. Um, what made you leave Hawaii and why did you come back? Um, okay, I feel like I can be honest with you. I was trying to get away from my mother. <laughs> um, when you went into cooking? No, she cried. <laughs> Did she so, want you to be a doctor? She wanted me to be anything but a cook. She, uh, so when I told my parents that I was, so <clears throat> I graduated from college and all my friends were doing glorious things like going to, going to law school, going to business school, going to med school, going into consulting, and just all of this sounded like terrible to me. Like I just I was like, oh my God, that sounds terrible. Um, so I told her that I was gonna go to culinary school <clears throat> And then she said right away, we're not paying for culinary school. And I said, okay, I'll pay for my own culinary school. So then I was like, I'm gonna go to CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and then it took, you know, it took me about a few hours to realize that I couldn't afford the CIA, right? And those, you're in culinary school here, so I don't know if you guys did research, but CIA is very expensive. And you guys are so lucky to get such a nice education for a deal. So when I told her I was gonna to go to culinary school, she cried and she said, what am I gonna tell my friends? <laughs> right? My mom's Korean, like full on. So, it's all about like what it, what it, what are you going to tell our friends? Okay. You have to go back in here. Yes. Okay. All right. So the most important thing in um, when you're cooking pasta is to not crowd the pasta, which I did, um, and also the pasta water. That's very important. So we, water and, you know, you'll learn this in Chef, Chef Abby's class too, is that like water fixes a lot of things. Water fixes emulsions. Okay. So do you see, it already almost looks like there's a sauce, except that I haven't added, I haven't added any butter. It's just the starch and the fat from the lamb. Okay, but that said, 
I'm going to add a bunch of butter. So my mom is proud of me now. It just took 30 years. But now she has lots of things to say to her friends. She has a lot of things to say to her friends, finally. Okay, I'm going to add the rest of this. I'm going to add the rest of this. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to add some pepper. At, you know, at FET, we don't use a lot of pepper. I, I have an issue with um, just automatically putting pepper on everything. We use pepper um, like any other herb or spice. We use it very judiciously. It's not a, um, it's not a given. And so what makes me really crazy, and I hope, I hope I'm not like stepping on anyone's toes here, is um, when I see salt and pepper mixed on a cooking station, it just drives me like crazy. Okay, all right. Remember what I said, we love herbs at that? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna chop up these herbs. I have local mint. I'm not done with the pasta, okay? So we pretty much finish all of our pastas the same way. We get the main ingredients in, and then um, restaurant style, we add some butter, and then we're gonna add some cheese, and then we're gonna toss, toss, and make it really, really shiny. And then we're gonna plate, taste and plate. So mint is unforgiving. If your knife is not sharp, it will turn brown. Parsley stays green. If I had to, if I had one piece of advice for culinary students, is to really, really pay attention to their knives. Take care of your knives, sharpen your knives. You can go like Japanese style where you end your day with sharpening your knife. And that's the discipline. So tired, right? You just finished cleaning your kitchen, your station, and now like, oh my God, you gotta like sharpen your knife. But that is the, that's a Japanese tradition. What kind of knife do you like? I like Japanese knives. Um, I have actually, I have, that's right now. One of my other favorite knives is um, a saboteur. It's um, carbon steel. It's the same knife that Julia Child used to use, but I find it's impractical. Like we're just, it's just like you have to keep it. Like can't have, can't do acid, and then like you have to like keep on wiping it. Um, and I just, I, yeah, I, I can't get it together. I, I would like, I would like to be able to that to be my like my, my um, my go-to knife, but it's just, I, I, I want to go too fast. Okay. So, I add, you see, I keep on adding water. Okay, now, now, this is a very important point. Um, at FET, we like to, we run it like our house, right? So, we choose to spend a lot of money on certain things, and then we like, comp not compromise, but then we penny pinch on other areas. So. One of the areas that we are a little bit frugal is while we're making the pasta, we always finish our pasta, most of the time we finish our pasta with butter and cheese. Um, and we use domestic Parmesan for, for that task because it is one quarter the cost of Parmesan Reggiano and it tastes delicious. It adds that salt. And then we save the really nice stuff for the garnish. The one exception is our carbonara. We use Pecorino Romano um, and Parmesan all the way for that dish because there's so few ingredients. Yep, adding more water, everyone. So. I don't know what the term is, but in Italian, they have a word called wave. And basically, when you plate the pasta, there's onda. Huh? Onda. 
Onda, is that what it is, Onda? O-N-D-A. Chef Matt says O-N-D-A, Onda. O-N-D-A, Onda. So when you plate it, there should be some movement, but then there should be some nice gloss too. So at set, I'm, Chef Emily and I are constantly asking the cooks like, okay, it's too tight, it's too loose. So like when we, especially when we do like pastas that have tomato sauce in it and you plate it and then like there's this pool of like liquid coming out, it's not tight enough. You want, you want the sauce to be clinging to the pasta. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Okay. So the other thing that we do, I'll be really careful with the zon stick, everyone. I'm sorry. Is that when you plate the pasta, so when you're going fast, there's a tendency for the cooks to want to just take the, um, the pan and then just start dump, 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 right? But what ends up happening is, is that you get pasta on one side of the dish and you get goodies on the other side of the dish. So we really want, especially when it's really busy, you have the um, cooks take a breath, take a breath. You actually have to slow down in this moment. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because Chef Emily or I are just going to have you do it all over again. So take a moment, like use a spoon, okay? Don't just pour it. And then we're going to finish it with the Parmesan Reggiano. Parmesan Reggiano. And a little bit more finishing olive oil. And that's it. It's like so delicious. Maybe Chef Don, do you want to take a bite for everyone? No, it's good. No, but they want to see you. Here, somebody take a bite. Here, Chef, Chef Abby. Abby's Chef Abby's going to take a bite. Uh, yeah. All the students are, are raising their hands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they, they want to take some bites. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. So when a, we had a new cook come <clears throat> into our restaurant. And he, I, I love this cook, I'm not going to mention names. And he was learning how to make this pasta. And the first thing he said was, you know what would be really good in this dish, chef? I'm like, great, tell me. And he's like, yogurt, like Greek yogurt. And so Emily, Chef Emily and I, Chef Emily is our uh, chef de cuisine, we're like, yeah, yo, this is not like a Middle Eastern, you know what I mean? This is an Italian dish, really, that has, you know, Italy, is long and has lots of influences from different regions. So we're like, you know, trying to convey to him that no, it, adding yogurt to this dish would ruin it. And so um, it was just it really, and then he just kept on pressing the issue. And I was just like, okay, you need to stop. You need to stop. You know what I mean? So when you go to someone's kitchen, when you go to your chef's classes, listen to what they have to say, absorb what they are teaching you. And it's just like, you know, like, like, you might not love everything. That's fine. But just absorb the information. And as you go along, you're gathering, like you're going shopping. You're gathering all these little nuggets that you can put in your cart that you can reference when you're in a certain situation. Yes? We have a few questions, yes. if that's OK. Yes. What is your most complicated dish on the menu? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I would say that's a really interesting question. Um, all of our dishes are complicated. Meaning, and, and I've always struggled with this because if you look at our menu, the menu reads very simply. It, like, and, and I almost to like a detriment, like it reads very simply, but then when the cooks actually start cooking, they are, our cooking is very layered. So lots of elements layered on top of each other that all have to be executed well in order to make the dish a whole. So I would say all of our dishes are complicated <laughs> in that respect. There's not like, and it's really, really hard. One of the hardest dishes to master at FET is the carbonara. Right? 
So it's like it's an emulsion, right? So it's like holidays or learning how to make mayonnaise, um, and it's t it's a time and temperature. It's all it's like making a custard, so it's like making creme anglaise, and so. I teach the cooks to make carbonara as if they're making a creme anglaise. Yeah. Alec and Raven are, have both been trying to sell the carbonara to the rest of the students throughout this whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's sort of like you, you have to know how it is and how to fix it. Yes. And the thing is, everybody, so if you guys can understand this, okay, everybody, all, everybody that cooks and is learning, they, they always say, how long, chef? How long, chef? And then you're just like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you making? Whose oven are you using? What's the temperature? What's your vessel? How much are you making at one time? Is it coming from the walk-in or has it been tempered? Like, there's all, there's like all, look, I'm getting chicken skin saying that because there's all these, this is why it's exciting, is because all of these things make every single task different. Every day, every day is different. So when a cook says, I'm bored, I'm like, oh, you're not gonna last in this kitchen. Because it's never boring for us. We're always trying to perfect it. And like going back to what Chef Abby said about like looking at the sauce, right? It's like, what is the carryover? How high was your flame? How much are you making? And it's, uh, it's understanding the carryover. So when I, when I teach carbonara, I'm like, don't even touch, don't touch the flame. Just move your pan on and off the heat. And then watch, watch, watch. Keep, keep everybody moving. So it's like that when we grill the meats, everybody wants to know, how long, chef, for the New York or for the, for the ribeye or whatever. And I'm like, it depends. So if you know what the end result's supposed to be, you will not make a wrong decision. So when, when, I, when, when students or like when our cooks nail the carbonara on the first try, it's purely luck, right? Hollandaise, you nailed it on the first day, luck. You don't even know what you're doing. Right? Yeah. You got to make it like six times, five times, ten times, every day. Every day, every, every day. And then one day, you can make hollandaise without a bay marie. Right? Because you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. What else? Um, what is your favorite dish to make? Um, Not for <clears throat> yourself, but, you know, in to people. Point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um... I don't know, it depends on my mood. <laughs> it really is, I think, like, and the reason why I'm not trying to give you like a, a stock answer, it's just um, like everyone's like, what's your favorite thing on the menu? I love everything on the menu. Nothing makes a menu if we don't love it. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is, it really depends on what is happening in your life. Sometimes, I'm so tired, all I wanna do, I call it like the picnic, the picnic cooking, Oh, you just like get like salami, you cut up, cut up cheese, you cut up some cucumbers, you buy some hummus, you like arrange everything nice, maybe you put some pickles out, you know, you, you display it and everyone's like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And with the, it, it's the intention put on the plate. So, so that's why like even when we go home, we order takeout, I insist all the food has to come out of the boxes. Always, it's very important. So I, and I'm going to talk about the pandemic now, but like we really struggled, all the restaurants struggled, but it really taught me about what we value, my husband and I. We value hospitality, not just the cooking. Like as soon as we could reopen as a sit down restaurant, first day we were reopening because we love to host and we love to entertain. We didn't go into this industry to do takeout and to just do takeout. We, we wanted, to, we like seeing people, we love that they come and celebrating or if they're sad or, so it's very important to us. Um, have you had any challenges being a woman in the kitchen? Um, yes, I, I think, you know, it's all the things that you read about, um, at, about, you know, the Me Too, Me Too movement and being passed over, um, and it's all true, except that, I don't know, just, you just kept them, I just kept on pushing. Like I just kept on pushing. I, I, I still, oh my God, 
I still get asked, if I, if I start buying something from a new vendor, especially if it's like protein, I always get asked, do you know how to cook that? Still, still, I still get asked. And I, I just like, I, it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm just kind of like, yes, you know, um, because they, they, they assume, or they still assume that my husband is the chef and, or they assume that I'm a pastry chef, no disrespect to it, Chef Abby. <laughs> um, but they, you know, there's this assumptions, you know, some of the best pastry chefs I know are men. You know, some of the best chefs I know are women. So it's not like, and you know, Mark Noguchi and I were having this conversation the other day about like, you know, what is my role as a woman in the kitchen? I'm like, can't just someone just look at me and see a chef instead of seeing, like having to, you know, and so it, it's, but it's interesting because he's like, no, but you have responsibility and he's right. Like I do have responsibility to talk about what it's like. So um, it, it wasn't easy. Oftentimes I was the only woman in the kitchen. Lots of sexual harassment. I feel like your generation is very lucky because it's being addressed finally. Um, and, and then also, I don't know if you guys know this about me, but we left industry for a while, my husband and I, because we didn't like it. You know, it was like long hours, nobody cared about our schedule, nobody cared where we went to school, nobody cared that anyone had children, nobody cared that you had 14 days in a row because they couldn't figure out the time off. Um, you didn't have set days, so you couldn't take like ballroom dancing if you wanted to. You know, like you could, you just never had a life and, um, you know, hey, come at 11, but don't clock in until three o'clock. Like that kind of thing. Like we, we endured all of that. And I said to my husband, we have to do better. Like why is our industry the last industry to like understand what is happening? So, yeah. Oh, so <clears throat> when we first opened FET, uh, who teaches cost control here? I okay. do. Right. So when I was in culinary school, they said they gave you some like crazy, like your food cost should be under 30% and your labor shouldn't be no, no more than 30%. And then you have your like fixed costs and it's supposed to, okay. Okay. It's, it's all, it's all, it's all BS. Sorry. Like it's all BS because the reality is, is that those numbers that were derived 45 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, were based on immigrant labor, right? So you paid somebody either under the table or you paid them minimum wage, and it was a ton of money for them because they were coming from a different country, saving all that money, sending it home. It's not like that anymore. The margins are so small. So when we opened up FET, we couldn't figure out how, like, why is our labor cost like 45%? Right? Like, why, why is that? We always had good, good food costs. Um, and then we realized, oh, because everyone was kind of being shady. So tr and, and, and now it's different. You didn't have to pay for health care. Right? In Hawaii, you have to pay for health care. So back then, when those numbers were run, it had no benefits, no health care, nothing. No sick leave. You know, so... And I when, think you would agree that now with the pandemic, things have gotten even harder. More, yes. So going back to Haley, what Haley was saying, when, um, when Chef Emily started working for us, she was, pregnant, she was newly pregnant. And I said to my husband, I said, we're going to give her maternity leave because it's important. And he's like, I don't know if we can afford it. And I said, the, the, the restaurant has to feel, has to, ha we have to put the restaurant through that stress test. Because if we don't do it, we're never going to do it, right? So it's very important. So, so we, we stress test that, and we, we give our cooks vacation, paid vacation after a year being with us. Um, and it's something that we're really proud of. Yeah, it's hard, though. It's really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you look for when you're hiring someone? Um, believe it or not, I actually don't care that much about their kitchen skills. <laughs> I look at their body language. I look to see if they're well-groomed. I look to see if they make eye contact. Um, I watch how they move in the kitchen. Most times, I would say all of our best cooks, they, they were, I, I find out kind of after the fact that they, they're actually good dancers. 
or, or good athletes. They move well. They just move well in the kitchen. Good peripheral vision. Um, and then are they listening? Can they, do they have the capacity to absorb information? That's what I'm looking for. I never ask them like, oh, make me an omelet. I never ask them that. I never ask them to make me hollandaise. I do want to see if they're comfortable handling a knife. So we do do a lot of like knife skills during the stage. But um, okay. yeah. Last question. Uh, what were the benefits of leaving Hawaii versus coming back? Um, I think leaving Hawaii, you, what I, Hawaii, I was like living with my parents and it was a very comfortable and very, um, I had a safety net. And so moving away from my parents and understanding that I had to be responsible for paying rent um, and feeding myself, it was very scary. So those, those lessons were really hard and you learn very quickly like, oh, I get Thai takeout and it has to be enough for three, three nights dinner because I can't afford it, right? So, but the interesting thing is because, because everyone was in that same position in New York City especially, people never called out because people had to pay rent. They didn't have the luxury, you know what I mean? Like it was almost as if like where, when, where I worked, like the chefs would be like, okay, you gotta go home because you're gonna die. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the, but, but people were so motivated to work because you have to pay rent. Like there was like, otherwise you're gonna be on the streets. And I think that was the biggest lesson for me. And so I, I thank my parents for always instilling a good work ethic, but that experience of being in New York City for 15 years solidified that. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, thank you so much, Chef Robin. Yay. We learned so much about lamb and it was delicious. Thank you, thank you everyone, thank you.